All right, I want us to think about sometimes when we buy new things and we get excited about new things. Because new things are so often so cool, right? If we think about new shoes or new clothes and new TV, maybe you've got these hobbies that you love. And so, Craig, you're into golf and you buy that new driver or some of you are into mountain biking, you get that new bike. And there's just something cool, extra cool about putting on those new shoes, about installing that new TV. Some of you even know what a new car smells like. And, and I, what, I don't know why we feel better about ourselves when we do that, but there is something cool about that, right? All right, but then not all new things are cool. For example, maybe you've got a new boss coming in and, and you're unsure, is this going to be a good thing or a bad thing? Or maybe you bought something online and you had to return it because it didn't live up to your expectations. Or maybe we think about some of the changes that are happening in the world. And yes, they're new, but maybe we're thinking these are bad new things rather than good new things. And I know something that is freaking out to many of us here is just the way technology is exploding and artificial intelligence, and some of you are on board, and you're the converted, and you're like, yes, we love AI, and some of you are so afraid. You've seen Terminator 2, and you're like, we're going one direction, right? And so, yes, it's new, but it's scary, and how do I feel about this? And so, as we talk about new things, I also want to talk about new music, because, you know, I grew up in the 2000s and the, and the 90s, and I just want to take a stand and say the best music was written in the 90s and the 2000s. So, <laughs> I'm not convinced that the new music is always that good. However, we all feel like that about our own music, right? But as we think about new things, you know, we've been doing this series on God's Spirit, God's Spirit that breathes God's life into us, God's creative life, God's life that brings light out of darkness and order out of chaos, brings new creation into our dark places. In other words, we have been talking about God's Spirit that brings newness into our dry places and into our dark places and our dead places. And, and you know, we've been doing this. It's one of the longest series we've ever done. Today is 19 weeks that we've been doing this series, and it's probably going to be the last one. And I say probably because who knows? Who knows what happens this week? But anyway, life groups have been talking about this for about a year. And so we have been immersing ourselves in the life that God wants to give us by His Holy Spirit. And as we conclude this series, I think thinking about the way God wants to bring new life into our lives and how we can prepare ourselves to receive it is so appropriate. So to focus our hearts and our attention onto God's heart and His Word, turn with me to Matthew 9, verses 14 to 17. The uh, words will be on the screen behind me, but always great for you to navigate your own Bible, be it online or a paper Bible, as we become familiar with God's Word ourselves. And so we're going to read from verse 14, Matthew 9, verses 14. And then John's disciples came and asked him, How is it that we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? Now, don't worry, today's not going to be a sermon about fasting, but it does provide the backdrop for the conversation we are going to be having today. So the Pharisees and John the Baptist's disciples come up to Jesus saying, listen, we're fasting at this stage. They were probably fasting, history seems to show us, twice a week. Now, as far as God's commands goes, in the Old Testament, the only day that was required for all people to fast on a regular basis was the Day of Atonement. If you look through the Old Testament, there were additionally the odd once-off occasions where there was a crisis and God's people came and fasted before him, but there wasn't necessarily a mandate or a command to continue fasting. And yet by the time Jesus comes, most of the religious people of the time are fasting twice a week. So they're looking at Jesus' disciples saying, how come your disciples aren't towing the party line like all the other churches in their area? So Jesus answers in verse 15, how can the guests of the bridegroom mourn while he is with them? 
I mean, let's not kid. When we're fasting, is it, it's a lot of fun. It's not a lot of fun. It really feels like our bodies and our stomachs and our minds are mourning for what they're used to getting. How can the guests of the bridegroom mourn while he is with them? The time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and then they will fast. Now, here, Jesus refers to himself as the bridegroom, which is really significant for a number of different reasons. The main reason is in the Old Testament, Yahweh, the God of Israel, is referred to as the bridegroom. Here's what we need to know about just how the Hebrew mind and the Hebrew theology and the Hebrew imagination worked. Very seldom, if any time, do you see Jesus stand up and say, I am God. But in very Jewish ways, he claimed to be God all the time. And so by claiming to be the bridegroom, these people, these disciples would have known exactly who the bridegroom is. It's just a Jewish way of claiming to be Yahweh. All right, so that's one layer. The next layer is when you're thinking about bridegrooms, and I've been privileged to marry some of you, and I was privileged to be involved in a wedding yesterday. It is not a time of mourning. Well, at least it shouldn't be. It is a time of joy. It is a time of celebration. And so Jesus, by referring to himself as the bridegroom, he's saying, well, while I'm here, it is not about this strenuous, painful activity, but rather about joy and celebration. Now, as I said earlier, today is not about fasting because these questions are being asked of Jesus and he does what he so often does. And that is he gets to the issue behind the issue. He gets to the question behind the question. And to do that, he draws on two metaphors. And we're going to read from verse 16. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch will pull away from the garment, making the tear worse. And here's where we're going to camp out for today. Neither do people pour new wine into old wineskins. If they do, the skins will burst, the wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins, and both are preserved. So Jesus draws on two metaphors to get to the question behind the question, the issue behind the issue, which for Jesus is not necessarily fasting, but the religious traditions that had evolved the hold that these religious traditions had on God's people and the way they were obscuring God's people from really encountering the true heart of God. And so Jesus uses two different metaphors to kind of get at this issue. And they both pretty much say the same thing, so we're only going to deal with the second metaphor. If you want to read about the other one, you can go and do your own research. But he's talking about new wine and new wineskins. And in order for us to understand why he uses this metaphor, we need to understand wine and wineskins at a material, physical level, as well as the deeper symbolic level that Jesus is intending it. So immediately everyone would have known a wineskin is for carrying wine. Wineskins were made, made out of tanned leather, and what would happen over time, just like our leather shoes, is that they would eventually degrade, start cracking, and if you had to put new wine, which by the way, and if you read in some of the other, uh, um, some of the other gospels, new wine is still going to be fermenting, meaning it is going to be releasing gases. Just press pause. By the way, some of you grew up being told that when the Bible talks about wine, it's actually grape juice. There's not a scholar in the world that believes that. <laughs> Let me just tell you, that's the biggest load of nonsense. Now, if you still choose not to drink wine, that's fine, but it's not what's going on here. New wine does what new wine does, and that is it ferments, it releases gases, which means it swells the wine skin. And if you've got this old, brittle wineskin, you will lose the wine and the wineskin. So what we need is a new wineskin, supple leather that can receive the wine, grow with the wine, and enable this wine to become a 2017 Cabernet Sauvignon. All right? And so that's the physical idea. 
But when it comes to the Scriptures, wine represents so much more than something to drink with your meal. British pastor and theologian Andrew Wilson, he's just got a great blog and, and speaks well and writes well. And he's got a book called Spirit and Sacrament, an Invitation to You Charismatic Worship. And he points out that in the scriptural imagination, especially in the prophets, wine means something more. It's pointing towards life. It's pointing towards hope, shalom, blessing, new creation. Let me give you some examples. Here's a verse that shows you how wine embodies blessing. Genesis 27, 28. May God give you the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth and plenty of grain and wine. Some of you are like, I think I found my new favorite verse. <laughs> so wine embodies blessing. Wine embodies happiness. Wine to gladden the heart of man. Oil to make his face shine. And bread to strengthen man's heart. Heart. Wine also speaks of love. Song of Songs 1 4. We will extol your love more than wine. Wine symbolizes bounty. And then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. Proverbs 3 10. All over the Old and the New Testament, we see that wine is served at weddings and feasts and other occasions of joy. Remember the bridegroom picture? And then finally, Isaiah 25 6. Wine symbolically points forward to the resurrection. And the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food and a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine, well-refined. Now, I said today is not about fasting. Today is also not a sermon on whether Christians should or shouldn't drink wine, or to say that the idea of wine and the symbolism to which it refers is an immensely beautiful, powerful, rich idea, right? Not something to be scorned at. So, Knowing this, because the people who are speaking to him knew their Bibles, and they would have known this imagery. So knowing this, Jesus is making this point that, listen, the bridegroom, the presence of Yahweh is here amongst his people. And what God wants to do is pour out new wine, meaning new blessing, new life, new joy, new creation. But, Mr. Pharisee, you have certain traditions that you have taken beyond the scope of Scripture. And you hold on to these traditions as almost greater than Scripture. If anything, these traditions have such a hold on your heart that you prefer the traditions to the new wine, the new joy, the new blessing, the new creation of God. And Jesus is trying to get them to understand that if I had to pour out new wine into your traditions, your ways of understanding who God is and how we are to love Him, we will lose the wine and the wineskin. Kind of like some of you still had an iPhone 5 and then the operating system got higher and higher and higher. And at some point, your phone went, enough. We cannot update to the latest operating system. And the same is true here. And so Jesus says what we need are new wineskins, new forms, new ways of doing things that are actually going to receive the wine, preserve the wine, and allow the wine to become what it ought to be, new life, new creation, new joy, new blessing, pointing towards our eternal future with God, the presence of God among us. So, how do you think the Pharisees responded to Jesus? Do you think full of, you know, emotional intelligence, they did some self you know, introspection, and we're like, okay, Jesus, you know what? You're so right. We've come to love our traditions far more than Scripture, far more than the presence of God. And you know what? We're going to give that up because we want the new wine. Is that how they responded? No, the answer is no. If anything, they doubled down to the point where they chose their traditions over the new life that is coming to us through the bridegroom to the point where they conspired to kill him. That's how much they were offended by him. Now, 
I hope you're seeing what's at stake here. This is not just like a, a minor scuffle, you know, like these online silly public debates we have on social media. This is not like a minor online scuffle between Jesus and the Pharisees. The issue behind the issue, the question behind the question, was the new wine that Jesus wants to pour out. New blessing, new life, a new way of engaging the presence of God. And Jesus looking for a wineskin, a way of doing things that can best receive the new wine. And He's saying, listen, your traditions are not sufficient to receive the life that God wants to pour out. And so that's where the real battle lay. And this was a, a, a debate that went on repeat all through the Gospels. Let me give you a few other examples of encounters. Mark 7 verses 13, Jesus says to them, Thus you nullify, you nullify the Word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. And you do many things like that. He's not saying, oh, you know what, guys? You know, maybe, you know, you're trying. Uh, you know, I see your heart. And can't you maybe think about doing things differently? No, he's saying the Word of God becomes zero in effect because of how you are appropriating God's ministry to His people. Matthew 23, just a number of verses, verse 4. He says about the Pharisees that tie up heavy, cumbersome loads. These are the traditions, heavy, cumbersome loads, and put them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Verse 13, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. Verse 15, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert. And when you have succeeded, you are making them twice as much a child of hell as you are. Any wonder they wanted to kill Jesus. Jesus is saying your traditions are nullifying the Word of God. They are a cumbersome load on people's shoulders. Your traditions are getting in the way of people entering the kingdom of heaven. In fact, when you win people over to your traditions, they have been won over to hell. So we go, ah, silly Pharisees. You know, Stupid Pharisees. Oh, I would never do that. I would never be like these guys. At least we're not like the Pharisees. But what if we had the courage to apply this teaching to ourselves? What if we had the courage to look at our own wineskins, our own ways of doing things, our own traditions, at which point some of you get really, really nervous because this sounds like the sermon that Steve preaches before he changes everything. All right, and, and what so often happens, and some of you have maybe been in churches where this happens, where some leader, some pastor stands up, he's got a bright new idea, and so often it's framed like my new way versus your old way, my preferences versus your preferences, my desires versus your desires. And if that is how it is framed, it is lose, lose from the beginning. There is no winner. But if we were to frame it differently, what if we framed it like this? How can we as a church do things to best receive the new wine that God wants to pour out. In other words, the goal is not my way versus your way, my preferences versus your preferences. The goal is new wine, God's life, God's blessing, the thing He wants to pour out among us. And so let's measure our practices, our traditions against that so that we can receive this new life, this new creation, this in-breaking kingdom life. Maybe if we're willing to do that, we may see that some of the ways we do things, as much as maybe they worked in the past, maybe I happen to 
like them from a preferential perspective. Maybe they feel very religious. But if we're willing to be honest, maybe you can realize that maybe some of the things we do are more like old wineskins that are in fact getting in the way of the new kingdom life that God wants to pour out among us. And therefore, we ask the question, in light of that, what needs to change? Now, let me reinforce this. Not for change's sake. Not because of some new trend that originated in the United States or or Europe or Australia. Not to keep up with the church around the corner. Not for the sake of being relevant necessarily. I think there's a good way of being relevant and, and a bad way of being relevant, but that's another conversation. But what do we need to change in order that more of God's life and power and presence and blessing and joy can be received and released around us? Now, let me put it in a different way. One church leader said these words that haunt me. He says, your system, in other words, the way you do things, your traditions, your habits, your choices, your wineskin, your system is perfectly designed to get the results you're getting. The way you do things, the choices you make, your traditions. And by the way, this doesn't only refer to churches as a corporate whole. It refers to our ministries. It refers to our own lives, the wineskins of the choices and the traditions and the habits that we have. This is such sobering news, right? That when I look at the fruit of my ministry, of our church, of my family, sometimes, yes, there are some things that are outside of our control, but sometimes what I'm dealing with is a direct result of the wineskin. This is why Jesus was so fundamentally opposed to the wineskin of the Pharisees. Because guess what? The wineskin of the Pharisees produced Pharisees. Produced religious people. People that everyone aspired to be like. And as Jesus says, takes them further away from God than anything else. The system of the Pharisees produced self-righteous, prideful legalism. And so Jesus was against that. And so Jesus is exposing here that sometimes we too are more committed to our methods and our methodologies than we are to the mission. We're more committed to how we do things because I like it that way because it is my preference than we are to the wine that God wants to pour out among us. Tom Rayner is an American pastor and leader, and he's worked in a lot of, uh, and written a lot of books about church planting and revitalizing churches. And he says, tongue-in-cheek, he says, well, maybe not so tongue-in-cheek. He says, the final words of a dying church are, but we've always done it that way. And so church, The big question, if we apply this to us, is are we prepared to become new wineskins? Something I've been trying to reinforce with the life groups as they've been going through the Spirit Equip series is, listen, there are new things that we've been learning. And for some of us, we are only at the beginning of a long journey of what it means to live a life that is empowered by and led by God's Spirit. Please don't move beyond the Spirit Equip series and the Unstoppable series and go, hey, remember the cool stuff that God did in that series three years ago? No, how do we continue to live and do things in such a way that we can best receive the new wine that God is pouring out? So if we think about this question, are we prepared to become new wineskins again? Some of you are freaking out saying, Stephen, again, this just sounds like you want to change everything. And I don't actually want to, and I'll tell you why. Because we've already been doing it and you've been great. A number of years ago, coming out of COVID, one of the biggest things we changed was how we did life groups. Not that we've cracked the code, but we're saying we're willing to try new things not to keep up with the latest trend. In fact, I don't know any other church that does life groups the way we happen to be doing it. 
But rather, how do we change the wineskin so we can best receive the life that God wants to pour out among us? I think about the service we had last year that is connected to HBC, that is connected to our youth takeover service we had earlier on this year. But last week, man, for those of you who were here, it was our first truly intergenerational church service where every single generation received and worshiped and worked together, where everyone was celebrated as equal vessels and vehicles of God's blessing. And let me tell you, as far as I'm concerned, that's probably a ministry highlights for me. And you know, you guys, so many churches would have responded with folded arms. Let's see what these leaders are trying to do among us. And you guys just embraced it. One of the other changes that we've been just slowly trying to, from conviction, try and do more and more of among us, just changing the wineskin, making it more receptive to the work that God wants to do among us, as we did the series on God's Spirit, is we started giving more and more space in our service times for God's Holy Spirit to do what Steve can't do what Bianca can't do, what the worship team can't do. You know, the old wine skin is, to quote from John Wimber, is I want to go to church for worship and word. And he says, well, what about one more W, worship, word, and God's works? Where we actually actively engage the working presence of God. And so we have been intentionally Carving out time and space. Some of you come from church backgrounds where that was more of the norm and you're comfortable with it and you're just happy to go with the flow. For some of you, it's brand new and you're either feeling very uncomfortable or very stretched and some of you are just, to be honest, you're bored and well, when are we gonna go for coffee? But the reason we did it once again was not how do we copy some church's wineskin? How do we keep up with the Joneses and the church around the corner? No, rather from the conviction that... God wants to move among us and not just through this guy, every single one of you. And how many people come in week in and week out and God wants to meet them, not through the people on the stage, but through the body of Christ. And God wants to give and grow gifts. And God wants to do amazing kingdom, new things among us that involves not just a few people called the prayer team or the leadership, but the members of the body of Christ. And so by conviction, we've been doing that. And we want to continue doing that as a church and grow into that as we learn to walk and hopefully run one day. And so as we think about change and the wineskin of Riverside Community Church, this will always be our motive. How do we better receive? the new wine, the new life, the new creation, the inbreaking kingdom and life of God among us. And once again, this should not only be true for our Sunday meetings, but for our ministries, for our lives, are we prepared to look at the wineskin of the traditions of how I do things and be courageous to admit, I think I was stopping God's blessing here. And so I'm going to let go of that for the sake of receiving God's blessing. As you can see by the tables in front of me and around the side of the hall and up there, today is also a day where it's just amazing we also get to celebrate the communion table. In fact, I think it's beyond amazing. I think it's providential where we come together to take of the bread and the wine, right? Luke 22, verses 17 to 20. After taking the cup... He gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruits of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And then he took bread and he gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, and this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Now, earlier on, I referred to some of the many illusions that just saturate the idea of wine in the Old Testament. 
we're introduced here to a number of new layers how the cup and the wine is connected to the blood of the lamb in the Passover and God releasing his people from slavery and how Jesus is the new lamb that takes away the sin of the world and how he is going to have his body broken and his blood shed for us. And so all these additional layers get added to this idea of what wine is. But notice once again that Jesus' broken body and shed blood, a.k.a. the bread and the wine, are the means by which we encounter the new covenants of God. The new wine, the new way of engaging the life in the presence of God. The new things He wants to do among us. And so as we come to the table, this, by the way, is one of those traditions, and I know many, many churches do it in very different ways, but at the heart of it is something that I think does best preserve what God wants to do among us. We come to bread and we break it, symbolizing the broken body of Christ. We come to, sorry guys, there's no cabernet here this morning, but uh, we come to some grape juice and we drink it, symbolizing the shed blood of Christ. Literally ingesting these elements that embody so much more for us and to us. And so as we come together, we're going to be playing some music over the system. And once again, please do not let your inner Pharisee come out and just do the tradition for the sake of the tradition. Let's get to the reality behind the tradition, the issue behind the issue, the new covenants, new life, new wine. And I want to encourage you that as we do this, that we take some time to repent first. We've got time. We sit there and we have the courage to look at our own wineskins, to say, God, you know what? There are some religious things in my life and there are some non-religious things in my life that are getting in the way of your new life and your new blessing. And I'm willing to name them and identify them and bring them to you in humble submission. repentance but repentance is not about turning from it's about turning to and so as we maybe go through a process of repentance then we're going to come to the table to symbolize to God what we are turning towards and that yes we do remember the cross and what is accomplished on the cross but also remembering that we serve a Lord that got off the empty cross who beat, beat death so that we can engage with God in this new covenant, this new way, so that we can receive this new wine. And so let's take a moment to spend some time with the Lord in repentance. Then we're going to come and receive the elements, take them in our own time as an act of turning towards the new wine that God wants to give us. And then we will have a time of ministry after that. So Lord, we thank you. That your heart is for us to know you and know your life and your blessing and your joy and your presence. And if it means breaking religious things in our lives, for you it's worth it, Lord. For some of us this may be painful. But this is the pain of a surgeon who's cutting us for the sake of life and healing. Holy Spirit. Enlighten us to see some of these old wineskins and give us the courage to say no and no further. And as we come to your table, we come full of faith and with open hearts and open hands to receive the new life you have for us. Come church, let's, let's do this together.